I make videos about rockets all the time, and I work on rockets professionally, but somehow I've never built a rocket on this channel. That's why last year I started working on a high power rocket to finally get my level one certification. Long story short, the FAA defines three classes of rockets. Models, like the ones you can pick up in a hobby store, high power, which is obviously more powerful, and advanced. High power rocketry is then split into three different levels of certifications, which determine how big of a motor you're allowed to fly. Certification is done by one of two non-government groups, the National Association of Rocketry or the Tripoli Rocketry Association. I'm going to be getting my first certification through Tripoli, but the rules are pretty much the same. Launch a high power rocket and return it safely to the earth. If the rocket is damaged, unstable, lost, or in any other way doesn't have a perfect flight, that's a failed attempt and I'll have to come back and try again, probably with a new rocket. So here's hoping this thing doesn't become a smoking hole in the ground. I impulse bought a bunch of rocket parts ahead of a long weekend so I could try to get as much work done as possible. This was the end of September in Washington and the weather was steadily getting colder and more wet. So there was a limited number of days where paint and more importantly, epoxy would be able to cure effectively. On top of this, my procrastination on starting this project meant that I only had a handful of weekends until the last launch event of the season in the first week of November. If I don't finish this rocket on time, I'll be waiting until March. So here's the plan. I decided to design and scratch build this rocket myself. There are great kits out there and they're probably better and cheaper than what I'm doing, but I really wanted this to be my rocket with room to grow and experiment once I get past this first flight. I went with a short four inch rocket to give myself plenty of room for payload and increase my drag and weight. Usually we think of rockets as light and low drag, but a common strategy for certification is to fly low and slow to limit the stress on your rocket and make recovery easier. The higher you fly, the farther the wind's going to blow you when you come down under a parachute. I also got a short plastic nose cone from Mad Cow. I think it's the same that they use on their Patriot kit. And my idea is that this short blunt tip would be more durable when landing. And that's going into a single 36 inch tube from Lock Precision, which I'll eventually be cutting into two parts so I can have a booster and a payload section. I base my plywood fins on the Argus. Argus fins are super simple. They're basically a perfect square and a right triangle where the side lengths are equal to your diameter. Slap four of these on a rocket and you're pretty much good to go, but I did make one slight modification by sweeping the trailing edge forward by 25%. This keeps the fins from being the first thing to hit the ground on landing, which could break them and mean a failed certification attempt. And in theory, they're less likely to get tangled in recovery lines. Speaking of recovery, I got a 60 inch top flight recovery X type parachute, which arrived as this incredibly high vis magenta. Seriously, this color is so bright that my camera doesn't even know how to process it. And this will all be tied together by an 18 foot tubular nylon shock cord. I went with sewn loop ends, so I wouldn't have to rely on my knot tying ability to get this thing back safely. I also chose a wide 5 8 cord to avoid zippering. If your parachute opens slightly too early or too late, while the rocket is moving, it can snap tight and cut into the cardboard body tube. A wider, softer shock cord makes this less likely. The first order of business was getting my electronics bay from Apogee Components assembled to get some practice with my epoxy. Bond only clean, dry. I picked the worst weekend to do this, my God. The bonds in this electronics bay aren't super important to the rocket, so they're low stakes. Also, for this first flight, the bay will not be holding any avionics. It's just going to be a camera and a basic altimeter. Next, I cut out my fins with a jigsaw and finalize their shape with a rasp. And by rasp, I should have said super fine file. Yeah, that was a pretty nasty chip, and unfortunately, it did not sand out. So I guess that one goes on the backside of the rocket now. Finally, I had the bright idea to actually use a power tool and I pulled out my orbital sander. This was also great for beveling the edges of the fins. Because the sanding pad is soft, it conforms to the edge and makes this super nice rounded airfoil edge instead of a hard chamfer. Then came the nerve wracking task of cutting slots into the body tube that these fins need to fit into. While measuring these out, I was very excited to realize that because this is a four inch diameter rocket with four fins, the spacing between the fins works out to be pi inches. So I drew lines on a piece of paper that are roughly 3.14 inches apart and then wrapped that around the tube to mark where my slots would go. Another great trick is to find the straightest piece of aluminum angle you can find at your local hardware store and use that to draw straight lines down the tube. Actually cutting the slots took a very sharp blade and a lot of patience. 
It also helps to remember that this will be covered with epoxy soon, so a few minor slips aren't the end of the world. After some filing, I was able to get the fins to fit into the slots, and we finally get a glimpse of what Surveyor is going to look like when it's all put together. Oh yeah, the, the rocket's name is Surveyor, you know, because it's my first high power rocket and a test bed for future projects. The next day, it was time to tackle the hard part, assembling the fin can. I'm using a traditional through-the-wall fin design, meaning the fins go through the slots in the body tube and bond directly to the 38mm motor mount in the center of the rocket. This gives me a very strong fin can, but it also means there's one big glue-up that makes or breaks the rocket. If the bonds are weak, the fins can break off, and if the fins aren't straight, the rocket can spin or be unstable. That's why I started the process at the warmest, driest time of the entire weekend and I cut some guides out of foam board to hold the fins straight while I epoxied them. I didn't think of it until it was too late, but there's nothing keeping these guides clocked to each other. If they're misaligned, the fins will have a twist in them, and that can cause my rocket to spin rapidly in flight. I just had to do my best to eyeball it and align them with the lines I had drawn on the motor tube. The fins are also sandwiched between two centering rings. These give it extra strength and also hold the assembly in the center of the body tube. I put a third centering ring at the forward end of the motor mount to give it even more strength and reduce the volume that my ejection charge has to pressurize to deploy the parachute. This one also comes with a hole for an eye bolt and that's what my shock cord is going to attach to. Next I taped off the fins and made some fillets by mixing epoxy with some West Systems 410 filler. This is a micro light filler which thickens the epoxy so you can make nice clean fillets on all of the corners. It's definitely not the strongest fill material but it should make sanding the external fillets a lot easier. By the end of that process, the light was fading and it was cooling off, so I decided to let it cure overnight and came back the next day to fill up the centering rings, install T-nuts for my motor retention clamps, and attach the shock cord eye bolts. I made sure that eye bolt was clocked so it wouldn't hit the walls of the tube, and I covered the threads in epoxy, because if this comes loose, there's no way to get it back together without cutting the rocket apart. Finally, it was time to cut the slots the rest of the way to the end of the body tube, sand the rings to fit, cover them with epoxy, and force them into place while racing against a 5 minute cure time. And don't forget to stop partway through to sneak an aft rail button T-nut into place before closing the rocket off for good. Nope, 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 nope. And that was it for my first weekend working on this rocket. Over the coming days, I would just have to work on it after work. I added a fillet to the aft end and tried to bond the slots of the tube back together. Then I taped off the fins and added the external fillets, which came out pretty good. That was until I destroyed them by covering them with Bondo. Okay, so there were some imperfections that I wanted to fill, but unsurprisingly, sanding off the Bondo did cause some wear on the cardboard tube, so I painted a layer of epoxy over it and sanded some more until it was finally looking good. Then I hit it with some white spray paint just to make sure there was a smooth transition from the body to the fins. At this point, the rocket was 90% done, but as with all projects, that last 10% started to drag on. I packed the recovery hardware into the tube to see how much room I needed, and then I cut the rest off to make my payload section, which wasn't quite long enough, so I had to cut this little nub off the back of the nose cone. Here's also where I weighed the rocket and found the true center of gravity so I could start updating my flight simulations. But now it's time to finish the paint job, and it's cold and raining again. At this point, I had joined a local makerspace, which would have been super helpful for the rest of this project, but uh, I hadn't thought to look for one yet. They had a canopy that I used to keep the rocket dry, and I kept the paint warm in a cooler with a pressure cooker full of boiled water. Hey, it's not stupid if it works. They also have 3D printers, so I printed a camera mount for my electronics bay out of white PETG. After several coats of paint, I let it dry for a few days, and then I masked off my livery with blue tape, resulting in this cool inverted color scheme. And then I went over that with a nice dark blue, this time without the rain. Unfortunately, the tape ripped the surface off my switch band, but I was planning to cut a hole into it anyway for the camera, so I guess it was just volunteering. And it's nothing that a little more paint can't hide. And finally, it was time for the fun part, custom vinyl decals. I put my logo between the fins and the name of the rocket between the payload section and this white band, which actually marks my center of pressure. See, the paint scheme isn't just cool, it's functional. Wait, hang on. Those are red pillows. What happened to the fall decor that was in the last few clips? Well. I have a confession. This was filmed on December 1st, well after I had missed that November launch window. This is where the rocket stayed for months. Christmas turned into New Year's, I made another successful Hexagon video, work got busy up until Valentine's Day when I realized it's almost March. 
And with the first launch of the season scheduled for March 8th, I was in a mad dash to finish the rocket, so this footage is going to be a little more sparse. I went over the entire rocket with several coats of clear coat to give it a nice shine and keep the decals from peeling off. I hacked apart the packaging of my altimeter to make a surprisingly good mount that fits into my electronics bay. I also had to drill some holes for screws that would hold the payload section together, and I decided to reinforce that area of the cardboard by soaking it with CA to keep it from tearing. While that dried, I put thread lock on every single threaded interface on the rocket. That includes the rail buttons, which I finally put into place. I don't want loose fasteners or vibration to cost me this certification. I also took this time to check the fit of my electronics bay into the tube. You want this to be tight so the rocket doesn't separate due to drag when the motor cuts out, but you also need it to be loose enough that the ejection charge can push it apart and deploy your parachute. What I found is that it was way too tight, not separating even with hard shaking, so I did a few passes with sandpaper, moving up to higher grits to get rid of the fuzzy texture which was acting a bit like Velcro. And I went a little loose on the fit because I can always add tape later to make it tighter at the launch site. But with almost no time to spare, I stole the mattress from our futon, loaded it into the back of my car with every tool I own, just in case. Then I took off after work on Friday and drove four hours east to the Tri-Cities Rocketeers launch site on a sod farm outside of Pasco, Washington. After one very cold night sleeping in the back of my car, I got to sit back and enjoy some of the other flights that were starting earlier in the day. This was my first time at a high power rocket launch and this was sweet. But there were also a handful of misses which didn't really help my nerves. See, there's about a hundred ways that even a simple model rocket can fail. The big one is coming in ballistic, either because you timed your ejection wrong, or the rocket was too sticky to come apart, or your parachute was tangled. This is obviously a failed certification, and it would destroy Surveyor. You can also be unstable, or straight up shred if the rocket isn't built well enough. So you can bet I was thinking about my glue ups on those cold rainy days back in September using a sketchy foam board jig which was aligned purely by eye. And if my own incompetence wasn't bad enough, there's also Kato's. <laughs> Catastrophic failures of the motor. Now these are most common with reusable motor cases which were incorrectly assembled by the flyer. So I should be safe because I bought a single use H100 white lightning motor which comes pre-assembled. But you never know. And even if the motor doesn't explode, it might not perform correctly. You can get something known as a chuff, where it partially lights, pushes you up the rod, and then you fall back down, and then it lights. I didn't see any of these, but Raiden from Rocket Vlogs recently lost his Punisher to one. And that's not even mentioning the 10 to 15 mile per hour winds, which were blowing rockets around and making recovery more difficult. But with limited time in the waiver, I had to get ready to fly. I checked my parachute packing and realized that it was a tangled mess, so I spent several minutes fighting with the wind to get it strained out and repacked. Then it was time to prep the motor. It comes with a capsule of black powder for an injection charge. This is what actually pushes the parachute out of the rocket. That injection charge is lit by a delay grain at the front of the motor. This delay grain is a small plug of repellent which burns at a known speed so that it lights the charge at the right time. Out of the box, or tube, the delay is 14 seconds, which is way too much. My simulation showed me that it should be about seven and a half seconds. So I used a delay drilling tool. This physically removes some of the grain, making its burn time shorter. I subtracted six, giving me a nominal delay of eight seconds, which is as close as I could get to seven and a half. Once you clean out those shavings, you add a washer and then you pour in the ejection charge. I used the whole thing just because this is such a large diameter rocket. And finally, you cover that with a cap. I put the motor in the motor tube and added my retention clamps to keep it from falling out. This thing sucks. These are just L brackets, which keep the motor from falling out or being ejected when the charge fires. These clamps are not great. I left too much of the motor tube sticking out, so they're struggling to grip the end of the motor. At this point, I can't really do anything about it, so let's just cross our fingers and hope that this holds on long enough to eject the parachute. I found someone to witness my flight for the certification, had them check out my rocket, and then I headed out to the pad. 
Now at this point, I was pretty nervous trying to focus on not messing this up at the last minute and my hands-free action camera was inside the rocket for onboard footage. So all the footage I have of this integration is from this far away fixed camera. Sorry, maybe next time I'll bring a second person to film. Once I had Surveyor on the pad, I removed the payload section so I could arm my altimeter, and then I carefully put it back in the electronics bay trying to avoid triggering it. Then the top went back on, I added the screws to hold the payload section together, and finally I installed the igniter. And the last thing to do is hit record on the onboard camera and walk away, hoping that the camera doesn't overheat or die before the rocket launches. But I didn't have to wait for long because I was first in line. So if you can't tell, I'm very excited. Unfortunately, the wind ruined any audio I got. So long story short, it was a beautiful flight. Dead straight on the way up, almost no spin, a couple excruciatingly long seconds late on deployment, but once it did fire, the parachute opened almost instantly. Now watching the footage back frame by frame, there is a sketchy moment where the shock cord wraps around the parachute and leader lines. This was caused by the late deployment. The parachute was pushed ahead of the booster, and then the booster fell past the parachute, dragging the shock cord around it. I'm super lucky that this didn't get more tangled, but I have a couple changes I can make in the future that might help with it. I am super stoked that this went so well, and I will definitely be back here with more projects and maybe a level 2 certification. We'll see, my motor mount is a little short for a J motor, but if you have any ideas for things you want me to try, let me know. I have a lot of plans for upgrading this rocket and there's a ton of room for new features and improvements. But for now, I'm Con Hathi and I'll see you in the next video.